My name is Richard Sandifer, and I'd like to welcome everybody to our program this afternoon. Uh, this program is being brought to you by RC Georgia and the Carlos Museum at Emory University. And RC Georgia, that's the first four letters of that are A-R-C-E, that's R-C, and that's an acronym that stands for American Research Center in Egypt. And um, that's a, a nonprofit organization which supports professional Egypt, Egyptologists and also people in the general public that are interested in Egypt, ancient Egypt in particular. And uh, it's to promote education and to promote uh, understanding of different cultures. And it's also being brought to you this afternoon by the Carlos Museum. And the Carlos Museum is uh, part of Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're here in Atlanta. And um, if any of you are ever in Atlanta, uh, or if you live close by, you should stop at the Carlos Museum because they have a little bit of everything. They have uh, Egyptian art, of course. They have uh, uh, artifacts from Greece, artifacts from Rome. They have things from Asia, things from Africa, uh, things from the Americas. They have just a little bit of everything. And they are really a wonderful partner to work with. And so, uh, uh, you know, I'd encourage anybody around here to check out the Carlos Museum. And uh, if you want to become a member of that, or if not, just uh, visit and uh, check out what they've got. And also I'd ask that you uh, check out RC and the RC Georgia, that's A-R-C-E. Just put that into one of your browsers and uh, Google on it and you'll be able to get quite a bit of information about RC. And uh, today's program uh, is the first of our winter and fall series. Uh, RC Georgia and the Carlos Museum have planned a series of five programs, or four programs, excuse me, four programs for uh, the winter and spring we have this one today, then we have one that is coming up in February, one in March, and then one in April as well. And so um, you're certainly encouraged to uh, connect with us on each of those programs. And we're very happy that you've taken some time this afternoon to be with us uh, for this program this afternoon. And um, I would mention too, that we have some programs coming up uh, later in the year. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the, fall of uh, 2020 is the centennial of the discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb. And so we'll probably have a program about that. And then also uh, Dr. Hartwick, who uh, uh, works at the museum is working on preparation of a new uh, collection of artifacts, which will be on display at the museum in 2023. And she, uh, we believe will be giving us a talk sometime this fall, that's not scheduled, but. Anyway, you want to be connecting with us because uh, we have things planned and we think that they're good. And so we encourage you to be uh, watching for these things. And if you uh, would like to get a hold of us, uh, send an email to RCGAINFO uh, and get on our mailing list and we we'll give you information about our programs. Uh, now, before we get into today's program, I just wanted to let you know that the program this afternoon is being recorded. So if you have friends that missed the program this afternoon, they'll be able to see a recorded version of it later on. And also, I just wanted to say that we will be taking questions at the end of the program. So if you have a question about the things this afternoon, what you need to do is just put your question down at the bottom of the screen in the box that says Q&A, and, a, and we'll, uh, we'll get to those things just as much as we have time to get to them at the end of the talk. And so we're very honored, very pleased to have with us this afternoon, Dr. Bob Breyer. Now, Dr. Breyer is um, from New York. He was born and raised in New York. And for his uh, uh, higher education, he went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he received his PhD in 1970. Now, shortly thereafter, he uh, began an association with Long Island University, which continues to this day. And uh, he, uh, at, at that place at, at Long Island University, for a time, he served as the chairman of the philosophy, philosophy department. Um, and he also, for instance, was uh, involved with the Egyptology Today program. In 2004, he was appointed as the senior research fellow. And, um, 
in addition to teaching at Long Island University, he's also done some teaching at the New School and Webb Institute. Now, the research interests of Dr. Breyer are wide ranging. Uh, of course, it's mostly centered around Egypt, obviously, but he's done considerable work, for instance, on mummies. And uh, he has been in 15 different countries, possibly more, but at least 15 different countries looking at mummies in these locations. And uh, uh, he's written uh, books about that. One of the books is uh, the Encyclopedia of Mummies. He's written Egyptian Mummies, Unraveling the Secrets of an Ancient Art. And uh, we have had some very good experience with Dr. Breyer in the early 2000s down here at uh, Emory University at the Carlos Museum. Uh, we had obtained a mummy and uh, there was uh, quite a bit of uh, mystery about just who, who the mummy was. And uh, Dr. Breyer was down here to help with that investigation. And uh, we won't go into that story, but uh, he's just uh, done quite a bit of work with mummies. And uh, in fact, uh, probably some of you might know he has a nickname, Mr. Mummy. And I hope he has a sense of humor because if you showed up someplace and they called you Mr. Mummy, I don't know. But uh, he does, uh, he accepts that, I suppose. Uh, his research also touches on the uh, pyramid building, on obelisks, on Egyptomania. And uh, his uh, research has uh, been published in things such as the New York Times, uh, Archaeology Magazine, KMT. He's appeared on television and CNN, 60 Minutes in 2020. So he's uh, well known. He's received many academic rewards. And uh, as I said, he's written several books. Uh, one of the books we'll be looking at today, uh, it's called Cleopatra's Needles, and I believe it was published last year. But I think perhaps uh, most of you, many of you, including myself, are familiar with Dr. Breyer because of his work with uh, uh, television. Uh, he's been on National Geographic Channel. He's been on the Learning Channel. Uh, he's had several programs there. And beyond this, he is well known for his uh, courses with the teaching company. Now, the teaching company has been changing names recently. I think it's maybe called the Great Courses now. And Part of it's the great courses, and there's another part of it's called Wondrium, and I think that's the streaming part. But if you go out there for uh, a certain cost, things aren't free always, but for a nominal cost, uh, you'd have access to excellent programs by Dr. Breyer about Egyptology. And I know the question comes up from time to time, well, you know, here I am out in this place, wherever it is, but in my place, they don't have courses on Egyptology. Well, you know, if you go out there at Wondrium or the great courses, you can uh, get courses out there that involve Egyptology. For instance, Dr. Breyer has out there three courses. One of them is the history of ancient Egypt. Another one is the great pharaohs of ancient Egypt. And then a newer one is decoding the secrets of Egyptian hieroglyphics. So uh, those are really some good courses. And it's a great honor and great privilege to have with us this afternoon, Dr. Bob Breyer. Dr. Breyer, if you'd go ahead, please. Well, thanks, Rich. Um, can we have the next slide? I, I think you have to control it, right? I do. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, the Great Pyramid. You know, most people, when they think about building and the great achievements of the Egyptians, they think about the pyramids. Because um, it, it's obviously the largest thing the Egyptians ever built, the Great Pyramid. Um, it's the only one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that's still around. Um, and it's in remarkable condition. But for me, it's not the most amazing thing that the Egyptians ever constructed. Next, please, Rich. For me, it's obelisks. Um, they really are remarkable. And that's what I wanna talk about today. Um, in particular, one, one obelisk that was moved in modern times. But you know, the word obelisk is, is, is a Greek word and, and it really means um, like a shish kebab skewer, a meat skewer, because when the Greeks came into Egypt and they saw these tall pointy things, they thought it reminded them of their ke kebab, so they called them obeliscus. So obelisk is really a Greek word. And all obelisks are a single piece of stone, and almost all of them are of granite, pink granite, and come from the same quarry. Now, next please. We're at the quarry now at Aswan. And what I think is remarkable about the obelisks 
is that they are not cut with chisels, right? They're not cut with chisels. We're at the quarry and you're looking at the quarry bed and I think you can see little squares right on the bottom. Now those squares have been pounded out with pounders. The Egyptians only had bronze chisels and bronze isn't hard enough to cut Aswan granite. So if I have the next slide, I think I could show you a pounder. That's it. It's made of a stone called dolerite, which is harder than the Aswan granite. So what you would do is you would take one of these rocks that weigh about 16 pounds, they're kind of like a bowling ball almost, but smaller, more dense, and you drop it on the, on the bedrock and you keep pounding away and pounding away. And that's how you get an obelisk. You pound it out of the quarry. Um, it wasn't an easy job. And we're pretty sure that it was almost always done by prisoners. There was an expression in ancient Egypt, he was sent to the granite. And I think that suggests that this was a punishment, not a job. Uh, but next, next, please, Rich. Yeah, and here you can see an obelisk is being pounded out from the quarry and it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, Mark Lehner, a colleague, did an experiment to see how fast can you pound out an obelisk. And what it is, is he, he took a, a dolerite ball to, to see how you, you could do it. And he just kept dropping it on the, on, the, on the granite. And he discovered that it takes about an hour to get a quarter of an inch. So every four hours, you've got one inch. So you can see it's not a quick, quick process by any means, but this is how they pounded, you know, obelisks out. Next, please. Now, part of the problem is how do you get the bottom out? You know, you can imagine getting it from the top down, top down, but it's still attached at the very bottom. And what I'm trying to do here is demonstrate how they must have done it. I've got the dolerite pounder in my hands and I'm pushing it horizontally to try to pound out the bottom. And what you would do is eventually you would have a tunnel going underneath your obelisk. And then once you've got the tunnel, imagine a rectangular tunnel going underneath the obelisk. Once you've got your tunnel, you take a rectangular block about the same size and push it in the tunnel. And then you make another tunnel and you do that three or four times. So you got these tunnels and then you fill it with the blocks. So eventually your obelisk is resting on these blocks. Um, not an easy process at all. Next, please. And this gives you an idea of what it's like, you know, while you're working. These guys were working shoulder to shoulder. They were prisoners and they would be working shoulder to shoulder. You can see here, there were about eight guys who, who were pounding at the same time. Next, please. Now, this is the big baby. This is what I claim is the most amazing thing ever constructed in Egypt. It's the largest obelisk ever attempted. Now it's much, much larger than the obelisk you see in front of temples, like in front of Luxor Temple or at Karnak Temple. This obelisk is about 130 feet long and it weighed a thousand tons. Now a thousand tons is really an incredible amount of weight. It's the same as two jumbo jets. And for perspective, I think you can see there's some people standing around it. I mean, this thing was just immense. And when I say this is the most remarkable thing that was ever produced in Egypt, I don't think there's anything that comes close to it. Now, the obelisk, while it was being pounded out by prisoners, cracked. And I think you can see two cracks. There's one, and there's one at the bottom. And you know, this one must have been one of those moments where, you know, no, you tell the Pharaoh, no, you tell the Pharaoh. Um, they tried to fix it. They tried to cut a blo another block out, but it kept cracking. So this obelisk was never, never taken out of the quarry. And that raises a really good question. How are they gonna get it out of the quarry? How do you move an obelisk that weighs a thousand tons? I mean, how are you gonna lift it out of this quarry Look at it. it, it's it's deep and there's granite block all around it. I, I actually have no idea how they were gonna move it. You know, there's a tendency, I think, to think of the Egyptians as infallible. They always did these incredible things. I'm not sure they were gonna succeed with this. I just can't imagine how they were gonna get it out of the quarry. Rex Engelbach, a, a real expert on building, had the theory that they were gonna lever it up that you would have very large levers under it. And then you somehow lever it up. But this is a thousand tons. It doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So this to me 
is the most amazing object ever produced. And I mean, it's heroic to attempt it, but they didn't succeed. Now I'll show you the difficulties. And next slide, please. You can see the tip of the obelisk, right? And where they were pounding, you can see it's pounded out. You know, you go into this quarry, you don't see chisel marks. These are all pounded out. And then when you get pretty close to where you wanna be, you start sanding it, right? So it's quite something. And you can see where the crack started towards the top and went down. Next, please. Now, as I said, we're not sure how they were gonna move it. The Egyptians rarely gave you details of how they built things. You know, we don't have any accounts of how they built the pyramids. The closest thing I have to moving an obelisk is this one image. It's in a tomb, Middle Kingdom tomb of Jehudi Hotep, one of the nomarchs, he was in charge of a gnome. And it shows his statue being moved. Now it's very instructive. The statue that we're looking at, the seated statue, I think you can see it's on a sled and it weighs 34 tons, right? 34 tons, not nearly a thousand tons, 34 tons. And you can see there's a mass of people pulling on the ropes, 170. It took 172 people to move 34 tons. I think you can see that the statue is resting on a sled. And there is somebody at the very front of the statue near the foot, and he is pouring liquid in front to lubricate it as the people pull. On the lap of the statue, right on top of his foot, right sort of by his knee, is a guy who's clapping. He is rhythming so that everybody knows when to pull. It's like a hop a ho, hop a ho. They know when to pull. In the lower left corner, I think you can see there are guys carrying spare parts in case the thing breaks, in case the sled breaks. And in front of him, are three guys who are carrying water for these people. And we have a text with it. This was a bit of civic pride. Everyone was proud to be pulling the statue of their nomark to his tomb. And the text tells us, it says, even the palsied, it says the man who shakes was leaning on the healthy one. So everybody wanted to be a part of it. So look, this is 34 tons. You can see how many people you need. Now imagine trying to scale that up for moving a thousand tons. You'd need 4,000 people pulling. You can't do that. The ropes don't scale up. It just doesn't work. So I really don't know how they were going to get that thing out of the quarry. I just don't know. Next slide, please. We do have an account of how they moved them by, by, by boat. Um, and this is from Queen Hatshepsut's funerary temple, Deir el Bahari. And what it shows is two of her obelisks being placed on a single barge. There are two obelisks on this barge. I think you can make it out. They're, they're bottom to bottom. So the tips are at the right and the left of the boat. That's the middle. The mid, that's one tip. And on the right is the other tip. And this took 23 boats to guide it to Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple, to Karnak Temple. Right? So you had 23 boats. And this isn't nearly the size of a thousand tonner, nothing like it, right? So this is really a remarkable thing to attempt a thousand ton obelisks. But anyway, that's Hatshepsut's obelisk. You can see, by the way, there are little rectangles on the ship, um, on, on the hull of the ship. That's because it's a sewn boat. The planks are tied together. You put it in the water, the wood swells, the rope shrinks, and it's tight. So they are taking these two obelisks for Queen Hatshepsut. Next, please. Now, how do you get an obelisk up? Well, this is our theory. No, no diagrams from ancient Egypt, but the idea is that you build up a sand ramp and you get your obelisk fairly high up and then you slide it down the funnel onto the base. And then with ropes, you can see on the bottom, we're pulling it upright with ropes. And I'm pretty sure this is how they did it. I've, I've looked at quite a few obelisk base, bases and always at the obelisk base, there's a groove cut in the base. And that's so that the edge of the obelisk catches on it, doesn't skid off the base, and then you pull it up with the ropes. So that's pretty much how we think they did it with most obelisks. Next, please. Now, 
let me explain what I'm, I'm only going to talk about moving one obelisk today in modern times. And it came about, Rich was mentioning in, in the introduction that I wrote a book called Cleopatra's Needle. This is the book. And when I was researching this book, I was interested in the three obelisks that left Egypt in the 19th century. One's in Paris, one's in London, one's in New York. Now the ones in New York and London are quite well documented. We know quite a bit about them. But the one in Paris didn't know much about. And as I started to research it, I realized that this is a really an amazing story of how Paris got its obelisk. So I decided that everybody should know about it. Um, so I translated the book from the French about moving it. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. But let me give you a little background on the New York and London obelisk first, and then we'll get to the Paris obelisk. Next, please, Rich. Now, there are two obelisks, there were, at Alexandria. One was upright and one was fallen. This is, um, well, I'd say about 1850s, something like that. That's what it looked like. So the two obelisks are upright. And for many, many years, everybody thought the fallen obelisk was broken, but it wasn't, it was, it was intact. And these obelisks were being given away by Muhammad Ali Pasha, the ruler of Egypt, because he wanted to curry favor with the Europeans. So he was giving away obelisks, you know, just, just sort of as, as favors to foreign po powers. And these two obelisks are the ones that went to New York and, and, to, and to London. Next, please. Now, we are looking at the way that the London obelisk was moved in 1876, right? It's, it was put inside a caisson, like a cigar tube, you know, the fancy tubes that cigars come in. And it was towed to England. Now, inside this caisson is the obelisk. And on this caisson was a crew of, of men who were communicating with the steamship that's pulling it. And you can see the way they communicate, they have like a chalkboard and the captain's out there saying, you can go faster. Now, so they're being towed by a steamer to London and they hit a storm. Next, please. This is the newspaper, the London Illustrated News. And the ship, the caisson capsized in a gale. Now the problem was you've got the crew on it. What are you going to do? So we see the steamer from the steamship, a rowboat was lowered and five brave men in a gale rowed over to the, over to the tube and the caisson. And as they approached it, a huge wave came and swamped them. And the boat went under and five brave men lost their lives. Right? Terrible thing. Eventually, the rest of the crew got the crew on the caisson off, got them on the steamer, and then sailed back to London because they assumed that their caisson had sunk. But it hadn't. The next day, another ship found it floating, still floating with the obelisk in it. And according to the laws of the sea, they claimed it as theirs. And the British government had to buy it back from them as salvage. So it was bought by the British government back from the steamer that, that, that found it. Next, please. <coughs> and there it is on the Thames Embankment in London it is today. Now, if you visit it, the tube stop, by the way, if you go by the tube, it's called Embankment. And if you visit it, walk to the back of the obelisk, the obelisk, the part that's by the water, and you will see carved on a plaque the names of the five brave men who lost their lives trying to save their comrades. And you know, there's an ancient Egyptian saying to say the name of the dead is to make them live again. So I always go there. And when I go there with my students, we read the names to make them live again. So it's a good thing to do. Visit the obelisk, look at the back and read the names of those five brave men. So that's the London obelisk. Next, please. Now, the obelisk next to go is the upright one. And here it is, right in Alexandria. Next, please. It was moved by Henry Gorringe. And what he did was he, he, he has a clad there. I think you can see it's clad in wood, so it won't be damaged when they lower it. Right? 
And there's sort of the obligatory uh, American flag. Next, please. And they're lowering it. They have a, they built a trunnel, this little, this, this metal thing. It was built by the way, by the Roebling Ironworks who had just completed the Brooklyn Bridge, right? So what they're gonna do is they have clamped the obelisk. They have clamped the obelisk onto this trunnel and they are going to turn it. They're gonna pivot it. You can see the cables on, on, on the obelisk and they are gonna pivot it. Now you see this stack of what looks like wooden crates. Those are just in case a cable breaks and when they're lowering the obelisk to, ho to horizontal, if the cable breaks and it starts coming down towards the ground, this will break the fall of the obelisk. And that's exactly what happened. A cable snapped, the obelisk started falling, but they saved the day, those, those crates, and the obelisk was saved. Right? Um, now, let's go one more slide, please. This is the steamer, the Dessoug. Gorringe bought a decommissioned postal steamer, opened the hull, and moved the obelisk in on cannonballs and sailed off to America with it. Next, please. This is the obelisk as it's moving into Central Park where it is today. To keep it at an even grade, they had to build a trestle. And what they've got is a steam engine ahead of it. And it's attached to the anchor chain and they're winching the obelisk along a few feet every time they move it move the steam engine, move it, move the steam engine. And this is moving it through the dead of winter into Central Park. Next, please. And this is the obelisk as it is today in Central Park. Now our obelisk, when I say our, I'm a New Yorker, our obelisk is the only one that has its original base. It's the only one. When it was moved, it was the largest object ever moved in New York on wheels. It's 50 tons. And there's a really interesting story about why we have the pedestal, why we're the only ones with the original pedestal. When Gorringe was, was commissioned by Vanderbilt to bring the obelisk back to New York, he wasn't told to bring the, the, the pedestal. But when he lowered the obelisk and started clearing the base of it, he discovered Mason's tools, like a, a set square, trowels, chisels. Now, Gorringe was a Mason, a member of the Masonic order. And he felt that his fellow Masons from ancient Egypt were communicating with him that they had buried these objects, the, the trowels and, and, and the set squares and the chisels to let him know that they were Masons. So Gorringe felt he had to bring the pedestal back too because it was part of the Masonic monument. So he brought it back unasked, he brought it back and there it is in New York on the pedestal. So two of the obelisks moved in the 19th century are fairly well known. The New York obelisk, we have books about it and we also have books about the London obelisk. The Paris obelisk is another story. Next slide, please. And that's what I wanna talk about today the Paris obelisk. This is an old drawing from 1798 by Vivant Denon, a member of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt. And it shows Luxor Temple as it was with both obelisks. Next slide, please. As you will notice, something is missing. One obelisk is gone. That's the Paris obelisk. Now in the 1830s, Muhammad Ali, currying favor with the French, gave them three obelisks, three. He gave them both obelisks at Luxor Temple and he gave them one at Alexandria, one of the ones at Alexandria. Now, only, only one was taken because it was very, very difficult to take an obelisk. Let me explain. The first thing they did was send a ship to, now this is 1832. They sent a ship to Alexandria to take the fallen obelisk, but they didn't have enough wood. They didn't bring wood. They didn't realize that Egypt didn't have wood. So they never took the, 
Alexandria obelisk, and they went home without it. Now, the Luxor obelisk was going to be even more difficult, but everybody knew the Luxor obelisk was the one that was in beautiful shape. Champollion had seen it, and he said, if you get only one obelisk, take the one closest to the Nile at Luxor. It's the best one by far. So France decided to take that one, and they sent Apollinaire Lebas, a young engineer, just out of the Ecole Polytechnique, to bring their obelisk home. They built a special ship to take it back, called the Luxor. Now, the ship had certain properties that were important. It had to be sturdy enough to hold an obelisk in its hold. It had to be able to go across the Mediterranean, right? And it had to be able to go on the Nile. So it was a very, it was a hybrid. It wasn't really a great ship. It was half of one, half a dozen of another, that kind of thing. But Apollonia Lebas was going to do it. Next, please. Next slide. There it is. That's my man, Apollonia Lebas. We know a little bit about him. He was very short. When I say very short, probably under five feet tall. Because when he came to Egypt to take the obelisk, he had to get the permission of Muhammad Ali. He visited Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali made a joke of it. He said, um, where is this engineer? I can't see him. Where is he? And you know, he was there, of course. They were just kidding about his height. But Lebar was you know, good spirits. He, he didn't take it in any bad way. And he got his obelisk, as you'll see. Next, please. Yeah. Lebar wrote a book about moving the obelisk. As you can see it, the obelisk of Luxor, a history of its movement to Paris, right? And this is a book that was very, very poorly circulated. At the very bottom, I think you might be able to see, you might be able to read it. It was published by the Division of Bridges and Roads and Mines for Paris, right? So it's really a civil service organization that publishes this thing and nobody ever read it. So I was, when I was doing my book on obelisks in general, I read this thing and then I realized this is a remarkable story. It has to be told. So with a colleague of mine, I translated it. So this book on obelisks that, that Rich was kind of showing you is not really my book. It's Apollonaire Lebas' book. And he was a remarkable man doing remarkable things. And I think you would all enjoy reading his story. Next, please. That's the ship that he had built to bring the obelisk back. When it went down the Nile, it was intentionally grounded. He ran it ashore opposite Luxor Temple so that it would be stable when the obelisk was put on board. Next, please. This is his plan. Now, all of these diagrams that I'm going to show you, all, everything is inside his book on obelisks. So you really should read it. It's, it's available on Amazon on the Apollonia Lebas, and it's really a wonderful read. Um, this is his plan for taking the obelisk down. You can see it's clad in wood. It's got ropes on it. And he's going to lower it very, very slowly. He's got a restraining means. And he's going to do it. Right? That's the movement of the obelisk. And you can see one more, this horizontal one right there. And that's the plan. Now, if you look at the very bottom of that diagram, he's written something. He says, this operation was executed in 25 minutes. It took him 25 minutes and that was it. And he had the obelisk on the ground, a remarkable achievement. Now compare this, let, let's, next slide please, Rich. This is a drawing of the time, 1832, and he's lowering the obelisk. And you can see there's a French flag. They've got a French flag there flying. It's, it's another thing he tells in his story of, of moving the obelisk. When he, when he got the obelisk, you know, it clad, his men climbed up and put the French flag, you know, on the, on the, on the apparatus. And they all said to him, you know, now we've got it. It's really our obelisk. It's got the French flag on it. And Apollonie Lebas said, no, you don't have it yet. It's not down. And this expression he used was, he said, don't sell, don't sell the bear skin until you've killed the bear, right? So he wasn't going to say it was done until it was down, but they did get it down. Next, please. Now, I want to compare this 
with the only previous obelisk move before Labah. Before Labah, the most recent obelisk move was 1585. It's the Vatican obelisk, the one that's in front of the Vatican today. It wasn't always there. Now the Romans brought it to Italy and it remains standing throughout the Middle Ages. It is the only obelisk to remain standing throughout the Middle Ages in Italy. And the reason is kind of interesting. When the Christians come in, they view these obelisks as pagan monuments and they tear them down. You know, Rome had like maybe two dozen obelisks upright and they tear them all down, except for this one. This one had been in Caligula's circus. And you, you probably know that St. Saint, Saint Peter was martyred. He was crucified upside down. He, he, when they were crucifying, he said, turn me upside down so that I won't be confused with our savior, Jesus Christ, right? He's a real martyr and he was martyred. And because this obelisk was there next to him when he's being martyred, it had witnessed the martyrdom of St. Peter. And the idea was that since it witnessed the martyrdom, it should remain upright. So through the Middle Ages, the Christians allowed this obelisk to remain upright. Now here it is standing next to the old St. Peter's. Now, St. Peter's Basilica was about a quarter of a mile away, the original from the new one, the one we know today. But what you see here is the title page of Domenico Fontana's work on how he moved this obelisk. Now, Fontana was an engineer and he is the one who was responsible for moving the obelisk just a quarter of a mile from the old St. Peter's to the new St. Peter's that we know today. Now, he didn't get the job immediately. It was put out for bids and engineers from all over came with diagrams of how they were gonna move it. And that's what you see here. All these different plans were each presented by a different engineer about how they were gonna move them. Many of them involved moving the obelisk upright. They were afraid to try to turn it. They were afraid it might break. As a matter of fact, Michelangelo was asked to move it and he refused. He said simply, and what if it breaks? So he didn't wanna handle it. So it was a bit risky. Now, in the upper left-hand corner of this engraving by Fontana, he shows his plan for moving the obelisk. He's got what he calls a castello, the castle. He's gonna build a very large structure around it that's gonna help him lower the obelisk. And Fontana, never, never one to be modest, shows that his plan is borne away on the wings of angels. It was divinely inspired. So that's Fontana's plan. He's gonna build this castello and he's gonna lower the obelisk that way. Next, please. <clears throat> this is the diagram that Fontana drew showing at the top all the block and tackle that he had to make to lower the obelisk. It's in the castello now. The obelisk is upright still in the castello. And on the left is the old St. Peter's Basilica. And I think you can see he's opened a hole in it because when he rotates it to horizontal, it's going to go inside the basilica. So he's got to have a room for it. And I think you can see there are men turning capstans at the bottom. And there's even guys hanging on levers. See the two levers, there's guys hanging on the ropes. This is Fontana's plan, which give him credit, it worked. But let me show you the next slide of what it really looked like. Next, please. This is actually moving the obelisk, taking it down. He had 100 capstans. All of these guys are, are turning wheels. There are horses helping. Um, and this has been described as the greatest engineering feat of the Renaissance. I don't think so. I really don't think so. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to have moved this thing a quarter of a mile to the new one, but Fontana really didn't know what he was doing. He threw so much labor at it that it worked, but he had no way of calculating forces and stresses. The only calculation that I know he did was he figured out the weight, the weight of the obelisk, which was about 320 tons. But otherwise, he really didn't know what he was doing and he was just hoping, but it worked out. Next slide, please. Now, 
Compare that scene with this one, 10 capstans. That's what Fontana did. Fontana, I'm sorry, that's what Apollonaire Lebas did. He was a real engineer and he could calculate stresses on the ropes, friction, forces generated by a capstan, how much one man could push. And he realized all you needed was 10. And that's what he had. He had 10 capstans pushed by about 10 or 15 guys on each one. And he had it down in 45 minutes. That's impressive. Next, please. He was so proud of what he had done when he wrote his book at the back are about 30 pages of calculations. All the calculations he did to figure out the stresses on the ropes, if the ropes would hold. So this is his calculations and this is a first. No one had ever done this carefully. Next, please. This is the era of science coming in. And that's how he did it. Next, please. He made some discoveries. When the obelisk was down, he discovered that on the base of the obelisk, obscured by the obelisk itself, was the cartouches of Ramses the Great. Ramses, you know, was called sometimes the Great Chiseler. He always carved out other people's names on their monuments and put his own to claim that the monument was his. So he's often called the Great Chiseler. Now he knew that this could happen to him. So on the base of his obelisk, on the pedestal, and on top of the pedestal, he put his cartouches so when the obelisk rested on top of it, nobody would know it was there and they couldn't chisel out his name. The obelisk base was cracked and you can see that there are two butterfly cramps put in it so it can't, can't spread. Um, this was also you know, shown by, by Lebas on, on his diagram. So there's the base. It's still there in, in, in Luxor Temple. When you go there, you can see it's cracked. And if you get a little ladder, you can climb up and see Ramsey's cartouches. People don't know it's there. Next, please. This is Lebas hauling the obelisk to the ship. And he's only got three capstans. That's all he needs. The guys are turning it. Now, one of the problems for Lebas had a tremendous problem. I mean, by the way, Lebas, you know, it took him five years to get this thing back. Five years before it was erected. It was, it was lots of problems. For example, cholera struck when Lebas was in Luxor and the Nile was closed and he could not get his wood that he had in Alexandria. So when he took the obelisk down, he had intended to make a slipway of, of wood all the way from the obelisk to the ship. But he couldn't because he couldn't get his wood because of the cholera. So he had to t use pieces, you know, just little pieces put together, move it about 10 feet, take the back of it, move the wood up front and keep leapfrogging to make his little roadway every few minutes. So anyway, they got it to the, to the ship. Next, please. That's the ship. I know it doesn't look like a ship, does it? Lebas was afraid that the heat of the sun was going to crack his ship's wood. So he covered it in reed mats and watered it every day like a plant to make sure the wood would stay moist. Now that he's got the obelisk in the ship, he's got to wait seven months for the Nile to rise so they can float it off the bank and take it down the Nile to Alexandria. Next, please. Yeah, that's a good one. So what he does, he decides to travel south. He's going to take some of his men, <coughs> excuse me, and they are going to travel south to see what's to see in Egypt. He goes as far south as Abu Simbel, which was a really big trip then. In the 1830s, very, very few people had seen Abu Simbel. This is a drawing by Belzoni. But, um, but he went there and they spent a week there taking measurements, doing drawings, that kind of thing. Next, please. Now, this is one of the funniest things in the book, I and mean, it's just wonderful. Lebas is a real human. When they were going through Egypt, they encountered a dance troupe. Now, these young ladies were called the Gawazi. They are dancers who, who go through villages and they put on performances and they're paid. You know, the people throw coins to them, and that's how they make a living. 
Well, Lebas saw these women dance, or one woman in particular, and he recorded it in great detail. It was sort of like the greatest thing the guy had ever seen. She performed what is called the dance of the bee. Now, it's a kind of pantomime, and it's an early version of a striptease. The dancer is dancing, and then she pretends that she's being harassed by a bee. And she you know, pushes with her hand and she tries to flick it away, but nope, the bee is persistent. Then the bee goes under her veil and she throws her veil off. Then it goes under her jacket and she throws the jacket off and you can see what's happening. Eventually, she's taking off all her clothes and she's naked at the end, faints, and then someone throws a blanket over. Now, Lebas went crazy over this dance. He talked about how wonderful she was, her gracefulness, her this, her that. It's really, really funny. But he wasn't the only one who talked about the dance of the bee. We have an account of his lieutenant on the ship, and he also describes the dance of the bee. And he also went nuts over it. And it's kind of funny because he, he says, he compares it with ballet. And he says, it's so much more human and, and, and lifelike than ballet, where you have these martinets up on their toes, dancing around like little automata, he calls them. He says, this is really dancing. So everybody went crazy over the dance of the bee. Anyway, Labar gives this wonderful account of his stay in Egypt. Next, please. He finally gets his ship to Alexandria, and he has a steamer that's going to tow it across the Mediterranean to, to France. They hit a gale, but they survive it. They do okay. Next, please. Uh, no, that's it. That's good. And they eventually get it to Paris. Now, believe it or not, it is going to be a year and a half before they get the obelisk erected for several reasons. One is the Seine, the River Seine, is also tidal and they have to wait for it to, go, to rise. But also, believe it or not, they had not yet quarried the pedestal for the obelisk. So they have to wait six months to get stones from a quarry to put together a pedestal. So, but eventually they erect it on the Place de la Concorde. And this is where Lebas, I, I just love this whole story of his, that's why I translated it. I just love the way he tells the story. He intended to do something absolutely unique. He's a techie, he's an engineer, and he's going to use a new engineering marvel to raise his obelisk. He is going to use the steam engine. Now, steam engines had not been used very much on land. The steam locomotive is not very popular yet. They used it on the sea with its less friction, but not on land. So it's a big deal to use a steam engine to raise the obelisk. And he says he is going to raise it with a steam engine, with no one touching it, just this machine. Now, unfortunately, he got his steam engine and he attempted to raise it with the steam engine and the boiler was defective and he couldn't get up enough pressure to raise the obelisk. So he resorted to capstans again. And this is the scene where he actually raises it with winches and they're, they're winching the obelisk up and there it is going up. Next, please. This is one of the few, oh, go back one, Rich, if you would. This is one of the few contemporary accounts. No, no, yeah, that's the one, that's the one. This is one of the few contemporary accounts of raising the obelisk. And you see there's a quarter of a million people, 250,000 people in the Place de la Concorde. And in the back, there are stalls where people are selling food. So it was a great achievement for Lebas. He is the first one in modern times to raise an obelisk. Next, please, 1836 is the year. And the king, Louis Philippe I, has a medal struck to commemorate the great event. And I think you can see at the very bottom of the medal, he gives the great honor of mentioning Monsieur Apollinaire Lebas, engineer of the Marine, Marine engineer. And Lebas was given a pension for the rest of his life. Next, please. And there it is today on the Place de la Concorde. Next, please. On the pedestal 
it shows the means by which Apollinaire Le Bas raised his obelisk. Next, please. Now you can you can visit Le Bas's grave. This you, I, I guess you can figure out which one is his. <laughs> he's, on, he's buried under an obelisk, in Le Bas. He's in the famous Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, um, where all the greats are buried, and that's where Le Bas is. And I often when I go to Paris, I often visit his thing and again read his name because to say the name of the dead is to make him live again. Next, please. And that's Apollinaire Le Bas. The man who raised the obelisk, and um, if you visit in Paris, the the the, the Maritime Museum, Musée Musée de la Maritime, um, you will see his apparatus. They have a little miniature of it, and you can see how Apollinaire Le Bas raised the Paris obelisk. But it's a fabulous story. It's one that few people know, and that's why I translated it. But that's the story of the Paris obelisk. Now I'll be happy to answer questions. Some, um, so if we can do whatever we have to do, thank you. Okay, that's. Wonderful talk. Uh, we do have some questions. Sure. Um, here's a question. Uh, these uh, obelisks were usually made of granite. Is there any religious significance to the Egyptians in granite? No, there's no religious significance. The reason they use granite is it's the only stone that is hard enough, substantial enough, that you can have a very long obelisk without it cracking. So that's why. OK. Um, you know, the, here's a question, the, uh, fact that they went to ask Juan to get the granite, uh, indicates that, uh, they had a pretty good knowledge of the materials available. Uh, could you say anything about what they, they, they must've known, okay, like you're saying that that was the hardest stuff available, but they knew where to go to get it. Um, so, you know, they had explored Egypt for the sort of minerals and that sort of thing. Well, the, the, the Egyptians were great stone workers. I mean, they, they, they you know, because it wasn't a, it wasn't a country with a lot of wood. <clears throat> you know, they didn't have really good wood. Um, palm trees don't make good wood. So um, they knew stone very well. The, 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 the most frequently used stone for good monuments was limestone. But you can't make a, an obelisk, say an 85 foot obelisk out of limestone. If you rotate it to the horizontal position, it'll break. It'll break. So I don't, so they, they knew what, what stones were good for what. For example, if you go through the Great Pyramid, you will see different kinds of stones used for different purposes. They used granite for the burial chamber, because you got to have an open area which is supported and they get bent. But they also used limestone for different purposes where they needed flexibility. They needed something that had a little bit of give to it. So limestone is used inside the, 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 the burial chamber, just above it for, for relieving chambers. So they had all kinds of uses of stone. They understood stone very well. You know, I've often thought that the only reason they could use granite was because the Nile flows from south to north. The Aswan quarry is in the south on the southern border of Egypt. And I think if the Nile flowed the other direction, if it flowed from north to south, I think they would have had a hard time bringing all those heavy blocks and obelisks against the current. So it worked very well because they could float it with the current. Had the, had the Aswan quarries been in the north in Alexandria, I don't think they could have had it down in Luxor as obelisks and things like that. So it just worked out well. Uh, do we know when the first obelisk was created and how did that come about? Yeah, it's, it's really an evolution. Um, in the Old Kingdom, there was an elongated round top stone that was worshiped called the Ben Ben stone, the Ben Ben. And later that evolves to the middle kingdom when you start getting real obelisks, big obelisks. The first big obelisks are middle kingdom obelisks with sesostruses. Um, so it's an evolutionary thing, um, but the Ben Ben is a kind of early precursor to the obelisk. Yeah. Okay, uh, for the obelisk, uh, there were inscriptions on there and um, mm -hmm. in ancient times, were those inscriptions uh, painted? And what were the inscriptions about? Yeah, well, actually the, the, the obelisk inscriptions are always boring. They don't say interesting things. What they almost always have are the titles of the Pharaoh. Obelisks were almost always put in pairs in front of temples to proclaim 
that I, Amenhotep III, built this temple. I, Ramses the Great, built this temple. So they come in pairs at the entrance to temples and they just have the Pharaoh's names. <clears throat> they very often would be filled in with a kind of green paste, a paste, not really painted, but filled in with a paste, but that's all gone now, that fell out. So now we just have the, um, you know, the, the Aswan granite to see. Okay. Uh, do we know what the cost of, of moving these, say the one that went to Paris, the one that went to London, and who was it that was paying the cost of moving these things? Ah, interesting question. Um, well, it was a different, different strokes for different obelisks. Um, the New York obelisk, I do know, it cost um, $50,000 and Vanderbilt paid for it. William Vanderbilt paid for it. And interestingly, by the way, um, when the obelisk was given by Muhammad Ali, the, 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 well, by, by the Egyptian government at that time, when the obelisk was given, it wasn't given to America. Vanderbilt wanted to make sure if he's paying, and he was a New Yorker, that it went to New York. So the obelisk was actually given to the city of New York and thus erected in, in New York for that reason. So that was 50,000. Um, I'm not sure about the other obelisks, how much, how much it costs to move them. Don't know. Do you know who is paying for them? Well, the, um, yeah, the Vanderbilt in New York, um, the, the French government for, for Apollonaire Le Bas, and, and the, Brit the Brits were paying for the um, London obelisk, the government. Okay. Um, it, there's a question about the uh, dolerite. It says dolerite is harder than granite. Yeah. And the, the person's wondering how they got those shaped to like bowling balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. That's a very good question. Um, the answer is the dolerite doesn't come in those bowling ball shapes. It comes in irregular rock shapes. But what happens is when you take it to pound and you keep dropping it, you naturally are going to drop it on the point, the thing that's the most pointiest, and that gets worn away and worn away and worn away. So eventually you wind up with a rounded stone by it being worn away, worn away over the months of being pounding, of pounding the granite. Good question. Okay, uh, there was a picture of the uh, obelisk in New York, and there's a question about the base. How is that obelisk stabilized so that uh, it it when you look at it from the picture, yeah. it's not a detailed picture. You can't tell. Originally, yeah. it would have had a really nice base, but now how is it stabilized? Okay, good question again. Let me say this about the Egyptians. They were so precise in cutting their obelisks that when they erected an obelisk on a pedestal, there was nothing holding it there except gra gravity. There are no pins holding it. There's nothing, it's just balanced perfectly. So that's how the Egyptians did it. But then when the Romans conquered Egypt and they started bringing obelisks home as trophies, they weren't sure they could just balance it. So they started adding bronze decorations at the bottom of the obelisk, pinning it to the pedestals that they had erected. So in Rome, all the obelisks had sort of decorative elements holding it onto a pedestal. Now, when the New York obelisk was moved, there were crabs very large crabs that the Romans had used to, to, to fix that obelisk in Alexandria, actually. And they were holding it, but those crabs had to be broken apart and taken, they're in the Metropolitan Museum of Art now, the pieces of it. But new crabs were fashioned, big ones, they weigh 600 pounds each. There's four crabs at the corners of the, of, of the pedestal and they are holding the obelisk onto the pedestal. So we have new bronze fittings for the New York obelisk for the London obelisk and for the Paris obelisk, but the Egyptians just had balance. That was it. Okay. Um, I believe in the book, when I read the book, and I think you mentioned it also in your talk this afternoon, that in particular in Rome, uh, they had like two dozen of these yes. things. And I think that they all came from Egypt, but um, yes. there are like 12 or 13 that they have now. So there are a few that are missing, is that correct? And what do we know about those obelisks that are maybe still missing wherever they might be? Yes, yes, the, the answer is yes. There's a, there's a dozen obelisks upright in, in Rome today. Now, as I mentioned, the Christians tore down all the obelisks, except for the one 
that they that witnessed the, the martyrdom. Now, as they were torn down, they eventually disappeared under the roads. You know, the dirt roads, they, they disappear. They get covered over with garbage, trash, whatever. And the obelisk disappeared. And in the, six, in, the, in the 16th century, the Pope, Pope Sixtus V, he wanted to have obelisks erected for, for, for sort of to the glory of the church. And he had antiquarians, these guys going through Rome with large steel bars poking in the streets to try to find the lost obelisks. <clears throat> so they found uh, you know, a dozen obelisks and resurrected them. Sometimes they were broken and they had to piece them together. Um, but there are still obelisks beneath the streets of Rome. There are probably a dozen that could be found. Uh, I guess nobody's looking for them now. Or... <laughs> Not now. I think it would cause too much of a traffic jam. It's bad enough in Rome. <laughs> okay. Um, what about the conditions of these obelisks now, like the one in Paris and New York? I think uh, there was some mention in some of the reading that I did that uh, the weather was causing yeah. some problems and uh, the condition, I don't know about in Egypt, but the condition in northern areas where they have cold and hot yeah. wasn't so good for them. Yeah, right. New York, well, I'll give you an example of New York. Um, I know that one best because, you know, I'm a New Yorker, but when, when the New York obelisk came in 1881, it had its first winter outside near the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's in Central Park. And what happened was it lost hundreds of pounds of, of, of flaked Aswan granite because water got into it. And when it froze in the winter, it expands and fractures the surface of the obelisk. So it actually lost quite a bit. Um, and the solution was a simple one. They waxed the obelisk. They put a wax coating on it, which you really can't see, and that protected it. So the obelisk is pretty well, and that's the same with the London obelisk, yeah. Okay. Um, the obelisks that are outside of Egypt, most of them uh, were actually given by uh, governments in the 18th and 19th century to these, these cities, these locations. Um, and they probably won't be going back, but has there been any thought about making replicas or, you know, like the one in Paris, you know, where yeah. there's one that's still standing, how about, you know, making a replica because now, you know, the technology, it seems like they can make a replica and send a replica back to take the place of the one that's still in Paris. There, there is talk of that. There is talk about making a replica. You know, I gave a talk in Cairo in October uh, at the new museum, the, uh, it's called the Nemec, the National uh, Egyptian Museum of Civilization. Um, and I gave a talk on this obelisk because I thought it's something people don't know about. And the first question I got asked after my talk was, is there any chance of us getting the obelisk back? You know, and I said, no, there's no chance at all um, because it was given legally and they're not about to give it back. But I think you're right. We could have a replica of it. And there is quite a bit of talk about making a replica obelisk. And I think it'd be fine. I think it'd be a good thing to do. They could get some from S1, granite from S1 to use to make it. And uh, then, I would uh, think they're going to use something like rubber or something like that. I mean, granite, is, it's just going to be too hard to quarry. You can't quarry a replica obelisk even, even nowadays. I think, I think they'll do it out of maybe wood that's coated with some kind of um, plastic on it or something like that. That's what I think they're going to do. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we still have some more questions, but we've sort of run out of time. And uh, let me just say that I think most of the questions that are still there, if you would go down to your local library or go out to Amazon or someplace, you can purchase Dr. Breyer's book. And I think most of the questions that you have would be answered in his book. So we really appreciate having you with us, Dr. Breyer. It's been a great talk and we just uh, thank you for what you've done and uh, just thanks for doing everything and we'll uh, take it from there. Thanks, everybody, for connecting with us. Bye. Okay, have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye.